Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Mo Vargas to the show. Mo is the president and CEO of Biotech. Mo brings new technologies to market, whether leading investor-backed companies or running growth and transformative initiatives in global corporations. His Fortune 500 experience includes executive leadership roles at GE, Siemens, AES, and Lockheed Martin. In addition, he has led four early-stage technology companies, including Biotech. Mo, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, great, Ross. How are you doing? Mo, I'm doing excellent. Had a fantastic morning, and I'm excited to speak to you. Awesome. I was very excited about doing this with you today. Appreciate it. So, Mo, where in the world are you? You know, today I'm uh, I'm in Miami Beach. Uh, normally, I live in in the D.C. area, in the Washington D.C. area, and we decided after uh, three four months of a quarantine that hey, why don't we uh, go down to Florida since the numbers are so low? Um, this, is, <laughs> <laughs> this is obviously about uh, six seven weeks ago before uh, you know everything broke loose here. Um, but I will tell you that you know, the nice thing of being close to the beach, we do get better views as we're quarantined in our new location. Well, I'm glad to hear that. How's the weather down there? Weather's beautiful. Weather's beautiful. It's nice to uh, be able to get out and uh, get a little exercise before you get the whole day going. So it's uh, it's always nice to be in, in, in Florida. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And I'm glad you're staying safe. Thank you. So Mo, I'd like to open my show by asking my guests the following question. If you were asked to share something interesting about yourself, what would it be? Um, you know, Raj, uh, some, something that I think uh, a lot of people don't know about me is I've lived in five different countries, uh, 18 different places through my life. Uh, my dad was Colombian and my mom is half Venezuelan, and half Chinese. And they met the college in college at the University of Florida. Uh, my dad was a chemical engineer for DuPont and my mom was a computer scientist for a telecom company. So you can see why, uh, you know, I have a passion for international business and technology. Um, you add that to uh, my grandfather being a big time entrepreneur and my father passed away when I was six and being the oldest of three, that drove me to start my own, um, my own businesses when I was 12. I, uh, I had a DJ business that most people, when, you know, when you go to these conferences and they ask for, Hey, uh, what's something that no one knows about you? I had a DJ business that had a payroll of about 15 people and did about five to six parties a weekend for thousands of people. I did import export of surf clothes and even built a uh, resale t-shirt business on all of these things while still going to high school. Um, so, you know, I've done, done a lot of different things, uh, have a very, uh, very much a mutt in terms of the mix of a family. So uh, that's something that's a little bit different than most. So very interesting. What were the five countries? Uh, so obviously born in the U S uh, lived in Venezuela. So U S from uh, zero to 10 lived in Venezuela for 10 years. I came back, finished up school uh, here on the West coast at UC Irvine. Then uh, did a whole bunch of expat assignments uh, with GE. I was uh, I was running a GE Mexico. Uh, then I came back to the U.S. Um, then went back down to uh, Brazil uh, with uh, AES. Um, came back to the U.S. again, and then eventually went to uh, Canada, up, uh, up to Ottawa, to uh, run a, a gasification business called Plasco. So it's quite a difference between South America and Canada. What times of year were you there? Unfortunately, I, I timed it perfectly so I would spend three of the coldest winters they've had. So, um, you know, <laughs> and, and considering I'm a guy who's uh, originally from Florida and, and really enjoys warm weather, uh, they said, you must really like the company that you're going to work for up there. So, but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, one thing I did learn was um, they have sun, you know, year round. Um, it's a very, believe it or not, even though it's, you know, uh, we had 30 days, 30 days of minus 30 degrees uh, C or more one winter it's very outdoorsy so you spend a lot of time outside so uh, you know learn, learn. and you have to because the winter so long it's not you kind of go uh, stir crazy so it, it, it's a it's a great country where in canada were you 
I was living in Ottawa, so in the, in the capital of the country. Wow. So between your recent move to Miami and Canada, I'm hoping you don't play the lottery, right? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> 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 at, least, at least not the weather lottery. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good. So Mo, switching gears a little bit, can you give a brief overview of Biotech, your current company that you're leading? Sure. Uh, you know, Biotech is a hydrogen generator um, manufacturer. You know, and our goal is to provide customer access to low cost, low, lower carbon hydrogen. And all of this is part of the, uh, you know, what we're all referring to now as the energy transition. Um, our, our reformers, the technology was first developed by Sandia National Labs. Um, and really, it's all about um, tapping into the existing $1.5 trillion existing network of natural gas infrastructure. Um, and really moving the production of hydrogen to where it should be, where it's being used. Um, for a little bit of background in terms of hydrogen for, for, for your listeners who uh, are, are maybe newer to the industry. Most hydrogen today is created through massive central plants, which are super challenging since they are very capital intensive, uh, usually in the hundreds of millions and some even to the billions of dollars for each plant. Uh, they require a significant portion of the output to be contracted. And since hydrogen is so light and transports only one third of the volumetric energy density of natural gas, it requires a lot of compressing or uh, liquefaction to be able to transport it from the plant to the end user. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, if you look at the existing infrastructure today, it, it, most of those plants are built right next to where the uses are. And the major applications are um, ammonia. Creation is about 50% of hydrogen today. And about 25 to 30% is for um, refineries. So for those that might not be familiar, what do the refineries do with the byproducts of the hydrogen or the hydrogen itself? Yeah, hydrogen is, is used really well as a, as a cleaning agent. So in, in their case, um, if you think about where our, um, a lot of the oil is coming from today, it's coming from um, you know, the, what they call you know, heavy crudes, uh, uh, crudes that have a lot of sulfur in it. And hydrogen is really good for taking sulfur out of the process. Um, and so when you, when you look at that, uh, you're normally going to have these big plants built right next to it because of the transportation issues associated with, um, with that. And, and what's happening today is that the new applications that are coming out, such as you know, fuel cells, are a lot smaller. So it's harder for these traditional business models of creating hydrogen centrally um, for them to move now to this new smaller one. And that's why Biotech is such a good fit, you know, being uh, a small on-site uh, technology. So two questions. One, you know, who is your typical market for this small modular unit? And the second one, how would the cost compare for the end users? Good questions. Um, you know, on the first one, uh, one thing that we're delightfully surprised about is so far we have about 17 different applications of people we put proposals together for. Um, it was something we certainly didn't um, expect to have so much uh, variety. And what you're seeing is people are realizing that with hydrogen, you can, especially when used with fuel cells, you get very high efficiencies. So when it, whether it's you know cars, trucks, um, buses, um, there's a, a myriad of other applications in both uh, in, in maritime or in the air uh, that are that are coming out and are growing pretty quickly. Um, so there, there's qu quite a bit of interest, in, and things keep on coming up. Uh, you have cell phone towers, um, you have drones. I mean, it's, it's just amazing the, the number of applications that are coming through. Remind me of this uh, on oh, price. Price was the other question you had. Um, one of the great things about this company is that we are the low cost provider in hydrogen. We are very efficient. Um, and when you look at, uh, you know, cost is really important to look at it from the application point. What does it cost a customer at the point of use? And whenever you're looking at that criteria, we will beat the pants out of, off of anyone else, including the big boys. So you mentioned 17 different proposals out, which is several different markets. What are the top maybe one, two, or three markets that are showing the most interest or that you've had the most traction in? Yeah, it's, it's actually 17 different verticals. So oh, uh, 17 proposals, verticals. Yeah, we, we just started our sales team up and uh, really you know, brought the whole team together in January of this year. And we've put together about $350 million worth of proposals for um, I think it's about 60 or 70 proposals that we've done for probably 40, 50 different customers. Um, in terms of the uh, application, where you're seeing a lot of interest today is around mobility. 
So whether it's, um, you know, you have a lot of fueling stations around the world. Um, you know, the leading economies uh, today in terms of uh, hydrogen are going to be Japan, Korea, Germany, France, uh, UK starting to get there, uh, the Republic, of course, of California. Um, and then you have a little bit of interest in um, some places uh, like Australia and Canada. So um, fueling stations everywhere for automobiles. Um, Hyundai and Toyota are already in Gen 2 of hydrogen vehicles. So it's nice because it was for a while a little bit of a chicken and the egg of who was going to come first. Um, then you're also seeing really, you know, where, where hydrogen really becomes interesting is once you get into heavier uh, loads, whether it be buses or trucks, um, there, there's just great applications for that. Um, and it's much, much more efficient than, than electrical. So I think, I think my view is on, on vehicles, we're probably going to end up being hydrogen will be to electric what uh, diesel is to gas. So you'll have some, but I think electrical is going to be probably a better application when it comes to vehicles. But I think once you get into the heavier side where batteries really become uh, an issue and the charging time and their performance in colder weather, hydrogen has a huge advantage over um, uh, electrical. The, the challenge is infrastructure, which is where we come in. So, I want to get to other markets too, but I want to stick with mobility for a moment. I had the pleasure of um, meeting the lead engineer who worked on the Toyota hydrogen truck, the one they did with the uh, pizzas working or oh, pizzas yeah. being made. Yep. So since Toyota is in my backyard over here, a good friend of mine is a VP at Toyota and he introduced me and we had a good conversation. And I brought up this point with him just because people of a certain age will remember the Hindenburg and that's what's stuck in people's mind when they think of hydrogen and mobility. How do you address that elephant in the room? Yeah, for, fortunately, we've come a long way. And, and when, when I when I first started in hydrogen, I had obviously the same concerns because it's usually the first uh, experience that many of us had with hydrogen, and it's so dramatic. Um, what's interesting about hydrogen is it's the it's the lightest element, and because of that, it um, it wants to escape, right? It always wants to escape. Where it when it, when it becomes dangerous, it becomes an issue is when it gets trapped, right? And if you get a lot of it trapped, and then you get a spark, um, the the explosiveness can will be bigger. Than other materials um, so it's really important in terms of design um, there has been because of that in that perception uh, if you look at you know manufacturers for cars um, anyone doing storage you know they do quite a bit to make sure that the the storage capacity is you know explosion proof and that they can contain um, and then you have to make sure you're using the, the right materials um, you know we've done a lot of work as a company um, with the um, uh, the society for uh, for for safety around hydrogen, um, and, and our, actually our chief technology officer is, uh, is on uh, one of their uh, their committees for, I think I believe it's for the, the conferences that they're putting together. Or I guess it's going to be a virtual one now. And there's a lot of focus around obviously the type of materials, and even when you do it get escapes, you want to make sure that you're not building things that are completely enclosed. So, for example, when you look at a picture of our container, it's not really a container. There are quite there are quite a bit areas that the gas is always going to be able to escape if it were to escape. Because you don't want to be able to, um, you know, let it accumulate anywhere. So I'm going to put a pin in the container because I want to come back to that. Going back to the mobility again, uh, back in 2017, I happened to be on the fringes of a conversation here in Dallas with EarthX when Toyota was going to do a hydrogen highway project from San Antonio to Dallas, mm -hmm. during which they were going to drive there. I think the Murai, they were going to drive several Murais that were fitted for hydrogen from San Antonio, Dallas. And one of the challenges they were having on the way was the refueling of the vehicles. And then last year, I had an opportunity to speak to Brian Goldstein briefly, who runs, I think, it's an energy organization in California that was planning on or working on doing these hydrogen fueling stations. So mentioned several challenges along the way. How do you see this you know, hydrogen fueling station opportunity rolling out in the future? You know, for us, uh, you know, on-site is going to really be a big part of this. Uh, one of the great things about how our technology goes about this is we just need either natural gas or biogas, uh, water, and just a little bit of power. and We can produce hydrogen. Um, because we can do it on the, in these 40-foot um, containers, we can really deliver, uh, deliver it almost anywhere. And it's a, it's a pretty easy install, too. Um, the, one of the approaches that we're taking to help, because there, there's, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit of an issue with chicken and egg of not being enough vehicles because there's not enough infrastructure and vice versa. Uh, we, we, we have one of the only technologies, not one of the only, the only technology where you can upgrade the size of the amount of hydrogen you're producing without having to change out our, the container. 
Um, and the other thing we do is we take an approach to market where people can either purchase, you know, long-term lease, uh, short-term rent for pilots. If people are testing out, you know, buses or vehicles or other things, um, or we've even launched as of last week, a, um, with a, with an infrastructure fund, uh, called cross river, uh, we've launched a business called Bayo gas where we're going to be actually setting up, um, SMRs in, in host sites and selling by the kilo to people who need, uh, either smaller amounts or are not ready to commit to. Um, engaging in one of the other structures that we have for um, receiving hydrogen. So you mentioned containers, and I wanted to get back to that again. I'm a big fan of containers and the opportunity to reuse containers. To be specific, can you mention what kind of containers they are and the portability and what you can do around the containers as far as stackable, side-by-side, et cetera? Yeah, so so we have a, a couple of different approaches. You know, one, so if you come and visit us, uh, you know, once... Uh, things calm down travel wise to Albuquerque, or I guess you can always hop in the car and drive over. Um, the, uh, you know, we've got to set up a container in the back. Um, you know, it's a container that has the, the doors open up all the way. Obviously this one's a little bit different because it's one that we use for um, doing a lot of our testing. That's grades or training um, or, or for visits too. Um, we, uh, we also have um, uh, our, our manufacturing partner called PESCO, who's out of um, the Four Corners area up in Farmington, New Mexico. And they, they will build a lot of the skids and build the walls and do those kind of containers too. So we've, we've looked at doing both ways, you know, depends on where it's going. Um, sometimes if it's, you know, us based and uh, they may want a little bit of a different configuration, you know, we may do a skid base and kind of build it up and put walls around it. So it looks like a container. If it's something that's going international, obviously it's going to be a lot more economical to uh, use a traditional container. Um, and, and in terms of stacking and all of that, um, we right now we're focused on um, you know just a couple of designs, but we have been talking with people where you know maybe we can shrink this down to a twenty foot container and make it taller uh, for certain applications, especially for fueling stations where you know space is at a premium. And I just want to clarify for the audience: when we say container, we're talking about a forty foot traditional shipping container kind of model. Correct. Yeah, yeah, forty foot, just a regular forty foot container. And I've seen the pictures on your website, and I really suggest people do that. You know, there's a lot of containers on the market now. I've seen some container living projects. I think um, the reuse of con- containers is a fantastic opportunity. Are you, you mentioned a manufacturer. Are you reusing existing containers too, or are you getting them all built brand new? Well, the I, I believe the one we're using in, in Albuquerque was a reuse. And um, now that you're bringing it up, it's actually a great idea. There's no reason we, can, we couldn't reuse uh, containers. Um, I don't think we have uh, any, any issue with that. I think it all depends on the uh, footprint, uh, the physical footprint available for our equipment that's going to be delivered. So I confess to being a little bit of a nerd with a wide range of interests. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, industries I follow is the shipping industry. There's a great uh, site called Splash 24-7 for anyone that might be interested. But I'm reading about the, you know, the decline in retail, and I've got some inside sources, different places that are telling me, in supply chain specifically, how many containers are being left on the dock right now with merchandise and what the container usage is going to look like going forward. And the fact that there's going to be a lot of containers, existing containers that are going to be left behind right now from a stranded asset perspective. Interesting. And so it might be an opportunity. I don't know, but I'm just kind of hypothesizing here in real life as we're talking. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I mean, I think there's a, there's a great opportunity. Uh, uh, I've definitely taken note of this now and I'll, I'll talk with our head of sourcing because um, obviously it, it's great to, you know, a big focus that I have is, is uh, or in a big belief of what I have in terms of my, my own personal values is to really try to, to do better as a society, right? And really trying to, you know, say, okay, where do we have waste in the way we've created our society and how can we reuse, you know, reduce or, um, or, or otherwise um, convert into something that's usable? Absolutely. So, so before great, we move on, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, I would say, so this is a great example. And, and obviously we could have some nice cost savings there that we can pass on to our, to our customers. Absolutely. And speaking of customers, I want to go back to one other market, which is um, the agricultural market. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, we're, we're really excited about the space. The, what a lot of people don't know is that the company originally was set up to uh, be a on-site ammonia um, provider of uh, manufacturing uh, generator. And what we've, what we've done is um, on, on our, our process of getting there, we realized that you know, 80% of ammonia is hydrogen. So before we can go and, and, and get into that field, field, we wanted to make sure that we were really uh, successful as a, as a hydrogen company itself. We were fortunate enough that in this space, 
um, you know, sometimes there are stepping stones when you have technology companies like these and you, you don't really have a, a, a middle product. In this case, we do. Um, and that's gone so well that, you know, we've really put a big focus on that. But in parallel now, we've, we've, uh, we've done a lot of preliminary work to, uh, for our on-site ammonia. And we're excited about uh, working with, uh, we have an investor, that, which is the largest fertilizer company in the world, who's involved with us. Um, and they're, they're really exciting about some of the work we'll be doing and we'll be launching probably in, in fourth quarter next year. And this could be a big game changer because um, to, to take a step back, one of the biggest uh, challenges that ammonia producers have around the world is that the transportation of ammonia is very dangerous. I um, mean, there've been a few incidents uh, that have occurred that, you know, have hurt some, some people. Um, and so one of the things they want to do and combined with that is that it's a billion dollar investment usually when you build every single, every time one of these plants. So, um, they would love to be able to reduce the number of, ma- of central plants down to smaller regional plants where they can then deliver to the retail outlets. So there's a really big opportunity for both a, a cost saving standpoint um, from a um, insurance insurability insurability uh, standpoint, and then also from an environmental standpoint. Because our technology is smaller, we can look at using, for example, biogas, which could help um, take a, a lot of the the carbon intensity out of the of the process. So I like the word game changer. And if you can perhaps explain to the audience the relationship between ammonia and agriculture, and then add on to that, I saw you had a recent uh, deal regarding the leasing of your equipment, and I think it was paying for usage only. So how that could all combine together, ammonia, agriculture, and then the opportunities for perhaps farmers to lease your equipment and the cost savings for them. Yeah, no, it, it, it's it's really exciting. Uh, um, you know, obviously, we we announced a deal with uh, Nutrien um, that, uh, that they decided to lease uh, one of our uh, hydrogen uh, equipments. Um, obviously, we we'd ideally like to take that uh, upgrade that to an ammonia piece of equipment, which would be uh, obviously a little bigger, but we'll get closer to the end product that they're really looking for for them to provide to their customer. So, it's we we look at it more as we we aren't necessarily looking to go directly to the farmers ourselves. But to work with world class companies, um, you know, like Nutrien, where we can help support their endeavors and go into that to that customer base. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, nitrogen fertilizer and all that, obviously that that's something that helps increase uh, crop yield significantly, and you know, it's something else that that you know really motivates our team because we realize that you know food is is going to continue to being a concern, especially as our population grows uh, globally. So anything we can do to really enable people to get access to fertilizer. Um, in the future, will obviously help everybody be able to produce uh, more crops and create more yield from them. Thank you for that. Now, changing gears a little bit, you mentioned you know personal values. The crux of our conversation is the why behind what you do. So you mentioned your background all the way from DJing and selling T-shirts to tech <laughs> companies, now running Bayatech. But you know, I've looked through your your resume, and you've been involved in. I'm going to say companies or programs, projects that have involved this thread of sustainability and renewable. So what's your why? What, what drives you, Mo? You know, I believe as a society, we can do better, right? And, and especially when it comes to using, whether it's waste or byproducts from industry and being more efficient in what we do with them. Um, I mean, I think there are also some great products that we can be, be creating from this waste. Um, the coolest part is that we can improve our environment and make money at the same time. Um, I think that, you know, I think that's, that's an important combination. And usually if you want to get industry and I'm, and I'm, I tend to be very much a kind of a pragmatist and love, you know, being on the execution side, you know, we need to be able to drive, you know, existing industry to, to new places. Right. And I think evolving with them um, and having a business model that works really um, helps, you know, and if you combine this with the massive amounts of capital that are sitting on the sideline right now, we can put this money to work, you know, using great technologies, you know, new ways to market and creating tons of jobs in the process, which obviously in, with the way everything that's happening today is, is, is super important. And, and I think uh, the, the, the biggest part of all of this is it's really fun. Um, and then also what drives me is to you know, work with, you know, great people. You know, I think that's the, uh, you know, people who have strong values um, and, and preferably that, that most of them, if not all of them be smarter than me. You know, I think, I think they're a, a lot of a lot of areas where I can I can use help, and so if I've got really good smart people around me, you know, we tend to do well. Uh, at Biotech, we've got an incredible team who's focused on our our mission, and, and not only of having a super cool technology that meets what we call our CATS criteria, which is cost, availability, throughput, and safety, 
but um, we're also focused on de-risking access to hydrogen for customers and then coming up with capital structures to make hydrogen accessible to anyone. Um, so our team is super driven, you know, they're, they're independent, um, global, and, and we're maybe, maybe a little too over pumped about hydrogen. <laughs> so sticking with that, why a little bit longer, I think if I read correctly on your profile, you got involved with sustainable projects 10, 12 years ago. Is that correct? Yeah, I started with, uh, you know, I was with uh, AES at the time. I was running a, uh, a $10 billion utility down in, uh, electrical utility down in, in Sao Paulo. And the CEO at the time of AES asked me to come up and run this joint venture with, um, that, that was with GE um, and with um, Mission Point Capital. And then eventually we also got Denim Capital involved too. And it was all around carbon offsets. And this is in the early days of carbon offsets. So we ended up creating a whole bunch of different carbon offset projects around the world. AES had a pretty big carbon footprint at the time because they, you know, their main um, way of creating power through uh, at the time was through coal. So it was a little bit of a play. And then obviously the European um, market was going pretty strong on carbon offsets too at the time. So it was just, uh, it, just it was, I think, the, the first time I, I really got strongly involved in realizing, hey, there's a lot of waste um, that, that could be captured, especially in the methane space, um, that we can do things with this and then, you know, get a carbon offset to, you know, help offset some of the, the other technologies that are, that are having challenges around carbon. So it sounds like you had quite an aha moment. For sure. For sure. I mean, it, it was, um, it was definitely an awakening, uh, going from, you know, just wanting to run large businesses to kind of realizing, Hey, you know what, there's something more than, um, you know, making money for, you know, for big corporations. And up to that point, I had spent a lot of my time after my entrepreneurial uh, earlier years, I had joined corporate America and, you know, worked for, you know, GE and AES and Siemens and, and was really, um, you know, moving up the corporate ladder and, and having some great opportunities. But I, but I realized, you know, there's a lot more to it. And I think you combine that with, uh, with having kids, um, you know, I've got three of three of my own, three all teenagers. And you realize, you know, you want to leave. And it sounds corny, but it's true. If you know, once you have kids, you want to, you know, leave them with a better world. Um, and so, getting involved in that, you know, really uh, motivated me. And then I realized, you know, how much pride they took in what I was doing, right? And so that, you know, uh, motivates you even further. So that resonates strongly with me. Listeners to the show know that I have three young ones, and a lot of almost everything I do, I try to think about. You know, what kind of world I want to leave for them, what kind of legacy I want to leave for them. So not corny at all to our audience and um, just letting you know that it resonates strongly. So on your journey, 10, 12 years, you know, and recently with Biotech, what do you say some of your major or big learnings have been? You know, there's, uh, oh my gosh, um, there, there's so much that you uh, <laughs> learn along the way. Um, you know, I think, I think uh, something that's really uh, important characteristic I look for, um, and, and I and I always challenge myself to, and I look for in team members is you know ability, ability and willingness to learn. I mean, I think this is super important for a characteristic for for people who want to have company growth. You know, whether you're in a you know startup like what we're doing, or whether you're looking for you know Fortune 500 company. And you know, once again, kind of referring back to my three kids, um, you know, I'm always trying to think about okay, what are the things that I can pass on to them? What are the mistakes that I've made? Uh, what are the things that I've learned from others, you know, and I've been fortunate to have some really great mentors along the way um, who've taught me a lot. Um, and it's always, you know, really sexy to talk about being an entrepreneur, but there are some really tough lessons that come from running your own business, you know, that you pick up along the way. So um, I would say the most important thing is to, uh, you know, trust your instincts and your gut. Um, I, I've learned that I don't mind making a mistake if I trusted what I believed in. Um, another one I'm always talking to my kids, especially because you, you know, you, you bring up your three kids and you think you bring them up with all the same values, but they all turn out to be, you know, genetics has a lot more to do with it. And you're just <laughs> teaching them to say, uh, please. And thank you. Right. Um, and another one is to play to your strengths. Right. And don't try to, you know, imitate someone else. You know, once I got comfortable with that and got comfortable in my own skin, um, I work, uh, you know, it's worked really well for me in both in business and in personal life. And it's amazing what you can accomplish, you know, once you get comfortable like that. Totally agree. So you've been with Biotech, what, just a little over a year now? Yeah, that's correct. Coming up on the year anniversary. Aha, surprise moments. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for me, it's, uh, you know, when we're looking at the team um, and what we wanted to do, um, it's always interesting when you take one of these businesses. This is my fourth time doing this. 
um, from a from a startup standpoint. And as you're you're putting the whole thing together, you know, you're 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 bringing. I usually start off by bringing in a lot of really the smartest people I know. Bring them in, have them look at the technology, let them look at the team. You know, just tell me the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, you know, so that that's always helpful. And so as I started doing that, you know, I started getting some really good feedback around the technology itself. Uh, the next thing I looked at was to say, okay, let's let's start bringing in and start. Retru- re- you know, we've got some gaps of some areas, you know, and I try to be very deliberate on, okay, here, here, and here, we've got to be better. So as we started going out into the industry and trying to recruit people, uh, we started finding that um, we're being pretty successful of uh, recruiting people from competitors, which is always a good sign, especially when you're looking at we've brought over people from electrolysis companies, whether it's, you know, ITM or Nell, we've brought in people from, you know, air liquid from air gas. So from the large industrials, from competitors um, and people with a lot of expertise. And we asked everyone who joins the team to, to relocate to Albuquerque, except for our commercial people, of course, because they're in, in the markets um, and that they're willing to do that um, was, was really important. Not that Albuquerque is not a great place, but it's not usually a, you know, kind of a destination point that people start off with, but, as obviously people have moved there, they realize it's it's an incredible place to be. A second, I think another aha moment was uh, we've brought on 15 um, agents to help sell and they're all working on the carry. So that's really important when someone's, you know, and if they're good and they're smart, which, you know, the people we've chosen are, um, they're willing to do that. That's a big sign. And then finally, I think the biggest aha was I knew that when we put the team together here, uh, especially, you know, towards the end of the year, beginning of this year, we were, um, you know, I was hoping we'd get a decent pipeline going. And I thought, well, if we can get, you know, $20, $30 million worth of quotes, that'd be great. Um, and we've got over $350 million of quotes that we put together in just six months. And so that to me was really the big <laughs> confirmation that we're onto a good thing. So it sounds like you and your leadership team was able to paint a compelling vision to attract so much talent. Let's stick with vision for a moment. Five years from now. Magic Wand, what does the future hold for Biotech? Yeah, we, we really expect to uh, be putting out um, quite a few units at that time, you know, probably in the in the hundreds of units uh, per year. Um, you know, we want to try to keep the team, you know, as lean as possible and find local partners. You know, we think it's really important, especially when you look at markets, you know, you know like Japan and Korea and in Europe, we I think having some, some local partners who have um, you know, some good participation in what we're doing. Um, will allow us to drive forward. And, you know, we really hope to be, you know, well into what the hydrogen economy is going to be doing, which by the way, we, we root for everyone when it comes to hydrogen. It's not just, you know, the, the kind of technologies that we use, we're rooting for, um, you know, really to, to, for this to take off because it, there's a lot of efficiency that comes from it. And I think it's, you know, it's time for, for, for us to move forward. So, you know, we're really excited about the, about the future. So, Stick with local partners for a moment. Is it a franchise mod- model, license model, or employee model? No, no, it's 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 a model where um, you know as we go into market, we'll find uh, manufacturing partners. Um, so we're, we're thinking about really having you know our our, our core core is obviously our partner uh, with partnership with with uh, Pesco, uh, based out of New Mexico uh, for the U.S. Then we're going to have a European um, manufacturing partner uh, there. And then we'll have a, a an Asian one, so probably most likely in either Japan or Korea, that will be our partner there. So um, as as we're doing that um, from a manufacturing standpoint, from a commercialization, um, I think for sure we want to have some local partners, especially in Asia, that we think uh, you know in, on a country basis where we can work with them. Um, um, probably probably from a uh, you know an exclusivity in terms of commercialization of the product, and then ideally we build the core technology which for us is the SMR and our water gas shift, sorry, our steam methane reformation and our water gas shift and our furnace. Uh, but everything else we want to do, uh, all the integration in, in the local markets. Got it. Thank you so much. So Mo, last question. Sure. If you could share some advice or words of wisdom with the audience, what would it be? You know, I would say, um, you know, be passionate about what you do and you're going to be happier and more fulfilled. Um, and I think if you, you know, the endeavors that you decide to work on or the jobs you decide to take, um, I think if you do that, the money will follow. You know, I worked at some of the best uh, large companies in the world and, you know, I had some great assignments and some that, you know, weren't, weren't as fun. Uh, I learned a lot about company politics and what to do move up the corporate ladder. But I also learned that, you know, in these type of companies, for me, at least, it wasn't always a meritocracy. And the last 12 years, um, I try to only get involved in businesses that I'm passionate about. 
that have an environmental attribute and where I, I really like working with the people I'm involved with. So I'm not saying it's rainbows and unicorns every day, but it definitely <laughs> makes a huge difference when you realize uh, what makes you tick. And it's amazing how much happier you are and, and how much more gets done because you believe in it and how well it can go financially. Mo, I appreciate you sharing that. I've so enjoyed speaking to you. Is there anything that I have not asked or explored that you'd like to talk about or share before we go? No, thanks, Raj. I really, really appreciate the time and enjoyed the conversation and getting to know you and uh, look forward to uh, continuing to listen to your podcast and, and getting to uh, know each other better. Thank you, Mo. Maybe one day soon we can meet in New Mexico. Absolutely. You're invited. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And you can show your support by sharing our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. If there's a subject or topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email, btu at nexuspmg.com or contact me via our website, nexuspmg.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share what we're reading and thinking about in the clean tech, green tech sectors. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production.